Welcome to the Coffee with Karen podcast, a weekly chat show discussing everything from holistic health to current affairs, from a mental, physical and spiritual perspective. Get your weekly cup of positivity with a sprinkling of woo-woo. Welcome to A Coffee with Karen. This is our weekly show on a Monday, a cup of positivity with just a sprinkling of woo-woo. So your host, my name is Karen Roberts. Um, So my program is all about helping women uh, get their mojo back, you know, actually increase their confidence. So if you want to take a look, you can go to karenrobertscoaching.com. So today we are going to be talking about forgiveness, right, and how it affects our lives, who it's for. And I have a wonderful guest today. Uh, Lois, I'm going to allow you to share with the audience a little bit about who you are, uh, where you come from, and what you do. Share a little bit of your story. Hi, well, I am Lois, your friend for forgiveness. (laughs) And uh, I'm based in Johannesburg, South Africa. And I always invite people to come and smile with me. So SMILE is my acronym that describes what I do. So I'm a a speaker and storyteller. I'm a published author with a a TEDx talk. I'm a mentor. The I is inspiring. The L is a learning facilitator. So I do training. And the E is empowering coach. So that is what I do, SMILE. Love it. And... Tell us a little bit about your story. How did you come to be doing all of this? Sure. Well, if I start my story now, you won't get a word in edgeways. <laughs> because I'll That's what you're here story. for. <laughs> but forgiveness, you know, it, it doesn't come to us naturally. So sometimes we need a kick up the backside that makes us wake up to the benefits and the beauty of what forgiveness is and the understanding of what forgiveness is. You know, we always say, just let it go, don't worry about it. Uh, And because usually it's little things, but when it's a big thing, uh, you know, I always say, can you forgive the unforgivable? (laughs) So I'll... Uh, Karen, do you have something that you feel is unforgivable in your life? Uh, I think I've been very blessed because I don't know that I have, but I do know people that, you know, have gone through a lot of trauma. And although we are taught, you know, we're always taught to, we we have got to let it go. We have got to forgive, not necessarily for the person, but for actually ourselves because what holding on to all that anger or resentment, what it actually does to us. But I can understand with, you know, various things that have the the traumatic things that have happened to certain people throughout their lives. I can sort of understand why initially when they don't understand what you're going to explain that, you know, even having the ability to forgive seems a little bit, way out there (laughs) absolutely uh and and especially when it's something really really deep and really bad so if i talk about how i got to really understanding forgiveness uh it took it took me 14 years after an unforgivable act for me to actually find forgiveness So what happened to me, I was brutally uh, attacked and raped and left for dead. And I, I, well, a lot of things happened almost as a result of of that. I was in in a printing business in partnership and I was working late one night in a little printing business. My partner had gone on leave and that's when I was attacked. And I never really wanted to go back to that place. And so I asked him if he would buy me out, which he agreed. But instead of buying me out, he put the business into liquidation and I went deep into debt. So we lost the business. I had to go back into the corporate world, get a job again, start all over. And 13 years later, 
I decided to go and work in the Middle East. So I left South Africa and I went to the Middle East where I was coming home. I'd been there for a year and I was coming home for my first holiday. So it was 14 years after I was raped. And in those in those 14 years, I'd never once really thought, is he still in prison? Is he out? He had been given a 25-year prison sentence. And I wondered if he had died, got parole. But it, ne it never crossed my mind before. But now, for some reason, I decided to, to find out. And so I contacted the authorities. And I asked them what was happening. And they told me that he was coming up for parole the day after I arrived in the country. Oh, wow, that was a bit of a coincidence. And in addition, the law had recently changed in South Africa, allowing what they call victims of serious crime to attend a parole hearing. The universe was speaking. There's your woo-woo. <laughs> the there you go. Saying it's too much, you know, the synchronicity, it's too great. I have to go. So my family and friends were all advising me not to go. What was I going to do? Was I going to support his parole? And I just said, I don't know. The universe has spoken, so I'm going. <laughs> so I went against the advice of my family and friends. But one friend said to me, if you are going, you need to forgive. What? <laughs> forgive the unforgivable. Don't be ridiculous. But it prompted me to go and visit Mr. Google. And I did a whole bunch of research on the topic. And I wrote this long speech just in case, <laughs> just in case. Anyway, so I went to the prison and it was it was quite an experience uh, for a lot of reasons. It was such a beautiful, beautiful spring day and it was a two and a half hour drive through this beautiful spring countryside and everything was so peaceful and beautiful. And then you come to this grisly looking building, the prison with all its barbed wire fences and armed security guards. But I went in and they were expecting me. I was, it turned out that I was the first person in South Africa to attend one of these new parole hearings. And so they weren't quite sure how to deal with me. And, and the, the hearing was in a, a room in the prison. So I had to go through the prison to get there. So I had to walk through all these prisoners and gates clanging shut behind me. So it was, it was quite eerie <laughs> mm. anyway i got to the room there were eight gentlemen there and they called in the prisoner and they went through all their proceedings and then they said did i have anything to say and i said yes and i pulled out the speech and i started reading it and as i was reading it i thought hmm, this is not working for me it's maybe a little bit too academic a little bit too stilted uh, the rapist was a uh, uh, grade he had a grade six education and English was not his first language and so I thought well he's if I'm not really getting it he's definitely not getting it and so I put down the piece of paper and I looked him in the eyes and I said I can't remember exactly now but I said something like I compassionately forgive you from my higher self to your higher self and I hand back the responsibility to you and I take back my power wow and, <laughs> and the most amazing thing about it is as i said it i meant it you know when i read that document it had no meaning but when i said it with that passion it actually i thought wow i'm actually really really letting go of the situation because as you said forgiveness you know when when you in unforgiveness you bonded to that person or to that situation and forgiving just breaks that bond and it sets you free you know you take the example of of somebody who cuts you off in the traffic and you are oh, you idiot and he's driven off he's not even aware that he's upset you and you boiling inside and so who's getting hurt by all of those negative feelings you're the only one being hurt and so it's really important that you learn to forgive because it does does set you free and so much so in my case the authorities told me they would let me know in seven days if he got parole or not and i said no you won't tell me 
I don't want to know. I don't need to know. Um, and I literally, I didn't walk out of that, that prison. I flew out of that prison. Wow. Totally, totally free of that, that individual. And to this day, I have no idea what's happened to him. My, that's absolutely incredible. I mean, how, I'm sure to everybody listening, I mean, that's an incredibly brave thing to do, to actually confront him, look him in the eye, and to be able to, to do that. So what was it? What was it that made you that that made you think about doing that? Had you was this totally off your own back or had you uh had you read something somewhere? What 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 led you to do that? Or was that just totally in sync with your higher self? Well, as as I said, I did visit Mr. Google and I did quite a bit of research and I uh, picked up some ideas and concepts from various web pages and what have you. And so it was a conscious effort, but the decision was spontaneous when I was in the prison. Um, you know, I sort of went saying, yes, I'll do it, I'll do it, but it wasn't it wasn't from my heart. It was it was just something I was told I should do. And everyone says I should do it, so I'll do it. But when I did it, it was from it was just from my total being. It just came so naturally. It was so easy. It actually was so easy. So right. I even posed, even posed for a photograph with the with the the guy. Um, I try to get hold of the the photograph to put into my book, but it's been so many years, and they've now built a proper facility, and uh, they've lost the photograph. Unfortunately, the the guys, the the one guy said to me that it had been on their wall for years and years and years. It was up on their notice board. <laughs> and, and is that like you said you 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 were obviously do you think you were sort of the you were the first person to actually go in confront your attacker and forgive them I, I mean what what did they think well they were astounded as I say they asked me if I'd pose for a photograph with them um they were yeah they were totally astounded and when i said i wasn't interested in finding out what happened to him they were even more astounded <laughs> so that's why the guy the guy I spoke to when i was writing my book he, he was the chaplain and he said i said oh i don't know if you remember me he says of course i remember you <laughs> he said you've been on our notice board for years <laughs> wow do you think so, then you've inspired others to actually do the same know. thing I, I really don't know. I'm, I'm, I've only been doing this work uh, for two years. You know, I was I was back in the corporate space and it was a good job and I was happy. And, um, and so it's only now in the last two years that I've been actively doing this. And I do think I'm inspiring people because everybody says I'm inspiring them. <laughs> so um, let's, let's hope people are, are learning to forgive. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I know it on a conscious level. I understand it, um, but yeah, I can, I can see both sides. I can understand why somebody would struggle to be able to do that if they were so badly um, traumatized. Or, but it's having that understanding, isn't it? That it's not it's not necessarily about them. It's about you know, people say, oh, it's like, you know, you're, you're drinking poison and expecting the other person to get sick. It's, it's, yeah. but it's so powerful. But do you think, I mean, I know you've come into this, you've said that you're going to be discussing this from a mental perspective. I definitely feel that there definitely is a little bit of woo woo in there. So it is the spiritual side as well. So, you know, what would you say to someone who has been wronged? So, you know, no doubt about it. But if they're struggling with that and it's affecting their lives, what would be the first thing that you would say to them to try and enlighten them as to the power of forgiveness, I suppose? Well, you know, I don't. When, <laughs> not initially. I've, I've designed a... Uh, process, I suppose uh, you can call it, 
but I've identified that when you first face some terrible uh, atrocity or challenge or adversity, and it doesn't have to be one of a sexual nature, it could be an accident or a divorce or the death of a loved one, it doesn't matter what it is, but you immediately go into a victim state where, oh, woe is me and life is terrible and I'm full of anger and hate and fear and blame and guilt and all of those negative emotions. And when you're in that phase, there is no way you can ever even consider forgiveness. You've got to deal with those emotions first. And so it's about identifying where you are on your healing journey before you can consider it. So, um, so you're first a victim. And then what you do, you need to develop resilience to get your life back into some kind of order and control. So your resilience is your courage and your creativity and dialogue and talking about it and coming to some understanding of what happened to you and then you become a survivor and even as a survivor you can't really consider forgiveness because you're just getting your life back into some kind of order and then you develop the grit and the grit is where you get some future focus some new goals new aspirations new direction and then you forge forward with passion and perseverance and persistence. And then you become empowered and you start thriving. And it's now that you can consider forgiveness. So I, if somebody has gone through something, I never tell them they must forgive. I don't even suggest that they must forgive, especially if they're in that victim mode. I might suggest some little activities if they're in the survivor mode just to get into practice for forgiveness. And when they're in the thriver mode, <clears throat> excuse me, then we can definitely talk about it. Right. So and it sounds, is that because, no, 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 you know they're still in victim. Yeah. So I suppose what you're saying is, I suppose on the, the emotional scale as it is, when you're down there in that victim mentality, Forgiveness is too big a jump. It's too far away. So you've got to slowly move up the emotional scale. And then that's a natural, I suppose, next step. But, yes, maybe it's asking a little bit too much for somebody who's really down there, which is it's natural, isn't it? Isn't it a natural instinct to go into, you know, you, you, you've been badly wronged. So... To have those feelings of it, it, it is, it, it, would you say it's a natural, it's natural, natural place to be initially? It's natural and it's essential that you you stay there for a little bit, you know, because if you push forward and you say, oh, get over it, you know, time heals and all of those platitudes that people use. Later on, a year later, 10 years later, something will happen similar to you, to somebody else, and you get triggered and it takes you back. And you, you've got to deal with those emotions. You've got to say, okay, I'm angry. How do I feel? What does it feel like? How does it look like? What does it smell like? And I take people through actually feeling your emotions and, and expressing your emotions in every way that you can express it. If you're angry, I've got a, a like a life-size dummy um, and you can beat it with a cushion. Uh, it's so important that you express it if you're angry. If you're scared, it's important that you lock the doors and you, you protect yourself because those are real emotions and they're there for a reason. And so you need to examine those emotions and feel them. Just don't stay there too long. <laughs> right. Okay. That's that's the, that's the thing, I suppose. So for some, some people will, I suppose, just try and forget it, try and block it out thinking that's the way forward, whereas what you're saying is, no, it's going to come up years down the road or just subconsciously you'll just be self-sabotaging because it's just there. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I went to, a, after I was raped, I went to a rape uh, crisis group session and there were two people, there was a mother and a daughter there. They'd been raped uh, 10 years apart. Both of them were walking around with big Doberman pincher dogs and guns. And the, the one was fairly recent. The other one was 10 years before. And you can't go through life living like that. You've got to work 
through it and work through that fear and say, all right, what happened? You know, what is the circumstances? How can I protect myself from that situation in the future? So it's, it's working through it, knowing, knowing that you don't have to live like that. You, you're living in a jail. You're living behind bars if you're living like that. And so you need to deal with it. Yes, I'm afraid. Okay, what does it feel like? How does it impact on my life? And what should I do to change that? And maybe you need to learn self-defense. Maybe you need to, I don't know, just change your route that you travel. It depends on what happened to you. But make those changes um, so that you can move on to the next level. Right. So it really is, it's a process that you take people through and and is there a sort of any kind of timeline or is it just different for everybody everybody's journey is unique um everybody will go through the different stages but some people will take longer than others it depends on so much it depends on on your resilience it depends on the support structures you've got uh it depends on everything you know so everybody's journey will be different but it's important that people know that they're not alone that there is support there's therapists and healers and groups and coaches the the are and and not everything's going to work for you you try this it doesn't work it doesn't mean you're not going to heal it means that doesn't work for you find something else that does work there are literally hundreds of different types of therapies so you've just got to find the one that works for you Absolutely. Great advice. So first of all, you know, let's go back to basics, I suppose. Why is forgiveness important? Well, without it, you've got stress and anxiety and it affects your health and your well-being. And and as I say, you have those triggers and you live in fear or hatred or whatever those emotions are. So it doesn't do your health any good. Um, and it doesn't do your mental health any good. Uh, and, yeah, it doesn't do your relationships any good because you're just not dealing with it and the people around you don't know what to do or how to how to talk to you or to to be with you. So it affects everything around you. So you've got to... You've got to let go of that but you can't just let go and say well i'll put it under the carpet it'll go away it doesn't it, it stays there um for example i was attacked from behind and i used to be terrified if anybody came up behind me i would jump a mile um and now you can come up behind me i probably won't even know that you're there <laughs> um, because My. it really does set you free forgiveness really does break all of those fears and uncertainties and all the negative feelings. So you want to just be free. Absolutely. Who doesn't want to be? But, yeah, I can, when you say about it, it will affect your health, absolutely, because, I mean, cortisol is the stress hormone and we know that that does um, so much, just so much damage. I mean, you know, yeah, the fight or flight, we need that response for immediate imminent danger however we know that if you're in a prolonged state of high cortisol levels yes it absolutely 100 percent that will have an impact um on your overall health and i think um personally i think that's there, there's m so much more to that than we even than, than we even know now um there's i, I don't think there's enough you know, um, in the medical profession, you know, they say stress, uh, you know, is not good for us. But I really feel that it's one of those things that's up there, more Im more important than than what we are generally being told by the sort of the medical establishment. Would would you would you agree with that? Totally. They they're still discovering every day. They're discovering new things about the brain and how it functions, and uh, yeah, so. It, we, we just know that the brain is impacting every part of your body. And then, of course, you've got the gut, the gut brain and the heart brain as well. So we mustn't forget the three, the three other, two other brains. Um, and that also goes like with your gut instincts. So you, you, you mentioned flight, fight, fight flight. Or <laughs> um, 
uh, you know, in my case, my gut said, I can beat this guy. And so I fought him because I thought I could beat him. And I could have beat him if I'd known one or two little tactics that I didn't know at the time. And that's the other thing we go through. We have this guilt. If only I'd known how to fight. If only I'd known how to fight. Because there were three or four occasions during the fight that I would have been able to annihilate him if I'd just known a couple of small techniques that I didn't know. And so I had a lot of guilt afterwards. Oh, why didn't I know how to do this? And so I had to deal with that as well. Um, and, and when it comes to forgiveness, you have to forgive yourself. So I had to forgive myself, A, for working late that night, B, for not knowing how to fight, and C, I had to forgive myself for some of my behaviors afterwards, I drank too much and <laughs> I went a little bit crazy. Um, and so those are things that you do and you need to forgive yourself for them. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, a lot of that is understandable. And then also, of course, you you know, you don't know these days. You don't know that if you had um, a little bit, you know, sometimes a little bit of knowledge can be dangerous, right? So if you did have some moves that you thought you could have done you don't know what you could have done you could have pulled out a knife could have pulled out a gun you, you, you know you don't know so yeah it makes sense that you cannot beat yourself up because what is it is what it is right there's you, you cannot go backwards yeah. and you know you, you, you've yeah. got to be grateful that you, you came through it right so it's yeah. all down yeah. to how we see it all, all down to our perception isn't it it's interesting. I've got two friends who are both karate, eight Dan karate experts who both teach a woman self-defense. And the one says you cannot defend yourself and the other says you can. <laughs> so, again, you've got to, you've got to know, if you've got some knowledge, you know whether you should fight or not fight or run or not run. And, and the, the, the big thing to know is you just want to get space. You don't want to hurt the person. You just want to get away. That's all you want to do. Um, so if you've got enough knowledge to know how to get away, and maybe a little bit of fighting can give you that time to escape. So it's those kind of knowledge, that, that knowledge that is so important. Yeah, right. But And again, but, you know, with the flight, well, I suppose it's more than fight or flight. There's the freeze as well. And that can happen. Uh, and, and and some of us, you know, I suppose we don't know. You know, I would like to think, yeah, I would, you know, fight them. But who knows? I might just, you know, if I was ever, you know, touch wood, I hope I'm never in that position. But who knows? You might just completely freeze. We don't know how we'd act in that moment, right? Yeah. But if you've got knowledge, it'll help you to make that decision at the time. Yeah. You know, you can weigh up the situation. He's bigger than me. It's, it's two of them. You know, it's not worth fighting. But if, yeah. in my case, he was a small guy, you know, I, sh I should have been able to beat him. <laughs> so. Ah, you're still being hard on yourself no, there. No, 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 no. I use it as an example. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, you, you say that... A you you googled you went to google to but ha, you know you know that's all well and good reading stuff about forgiveness and but you know how would you say that you what was the the real thing that how did you get to forgive i suppose it, it was spontaneous you know um again knowledge having that knowledge helped me at the time to just say i forgive so the research to read books and to read what other people are doing and suggesting, there's, the trouble is there's so much out there. There's just so much information that you get overwhelmed by it. But if you've got that knowledge, then you your gut, you go to that gut brain and you let that gut instinct talk to you and make that decision for you. And if you're not ready, you're not ready. And so you've got to make sure that you're in the right place before you forgive. And I, I've got to, I suggest that people, everybody practices forgiveness. So gratitude is now a very accepted thing. And everybody writes three gratitude issues every day. Everybody has a gratitude journal and it's so accepted. 
And I'm saying, well, let's keep a, a forgiveness journal as well. So I forgive myself for burning the toast. I forgive myself for hitting the snooze button. And I forgive myself for smacking the dog. And then three a day. And then every day, three for somebody else. I forgive the dog for eating my slipper. <laughs> I, forgive, I forgive the husband for forgetting to buy the milk on his way home. So this, we all make mistakes and we all do things that are not right. <laughs> and some of them are, are done on purpose. Some are done by accident. Some we're hardly even aware that we've done something wrong. So if we just get into the habit of every day, three things I forgive myself for and I forgive other people for, it becomes a habit and it becomes so much easier that when it comes to the big thing, you already understand how good it feels to forgive and it makes that big decision so much easier. Right, and now that makes a lot of sense because like so far up to now we've we've spoken about the need to forgive the major things you know the really traumatic but actually what you're saying is is you know there's things that we'll do every single day that we probably we possibly don't even know that we beat ourselves up over right so yeah what you're saying there is um Make, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Get into that habit of because we don't. We, you know, most of us we are very hard on ourselves. The way we talk to ourselves, we never would dream of talking to somebody else the way we talk to ourselves sometimes. And so, yeah, we should be in the habit of celebrating our little wins and forgiving all the little things that we do as well. Mm. Fantastic advice because yes, it is. That would make sense that, yeah, if we are a little bit kinder to ourselves and forgive the smaller things, then, yeah, it's going to be easier for us because, yeah, we know how it feels. So can you describe, can you give one word to describe the feeling that you had when you spontaneously forgave your attacker? Freedom. <laughs> Uh, just so light and free and and ex it was ecstatic. So sorry, that's more than one word. Ah, but that's okay. You can have as many as you like. <laughs> but yeah, it, it really is. As I said, I flew. I flew out of there. I felt so light and I put down this heavy, heavy burden that I'd been carrying for fourteen years, and it, it was a relief. And that's another word. It was actually a relief to say wow that's behind me now yeah it's right so i uh, suppose yeah people that are carrying it around for so many years um yeah that maybe it seems such a such a big thing so far away so can you explain to people a little bit about then how you work as a well, I mean, you're a bit of everything, really, a mentor, you're inspiring people, you're, I presume you coach people throughout this process? Yes, so the first thing is to identify where they are on their healing journey. And then if they need to develop resilience, I give them te te techniques and I teach them how to develop and build their resilience and how to get to the survivor level. And if they're at survivor level, then I help them develop the grit. And in terms of developing the grit, I can go broader than just the healing journey. I go into their careers and what they want to do with their lives. And, you know, we get post-traumatic growth after we've been through a traumatic situation. And what do we do with that information? So it's about developing your growth mindset and and what have you learned how have you grown how have you developed and maybe it takes you in a whole new direction in your life you might find a new career or you don't you want to change you want to change your home you want to change your living situation because you've got a whole new passion now you've got a whole new direction to to follow um, and some of us will be, we get what I call a benefit mindset. And that is saying, well, now I'm going to give back. I'm going to use my experience to gift it to other people. Um, and so it, I help them on that whole process of, of finding their grit 
and finding their future, developing their their goals and their aspirations and, and setting guidelines on how to do that. And I can do it all either through a mentoring or a coaching process, but I like a, a combined a combined situation, which is part coaching where they do it themselves and part mentoring where I give them guidance. Right. Yeah, because I think everybody, you know, don't we all need um, a little bit of guidance? That can be you know, one of the things sometimes we think we can do it all by ourselves. And actually, you know what? We all need, <laughs> I think we all need coaches. We all need somebody to help us, guide us wherever we are. Like you say, wherever you are on the healing journey, I think everybody would benefit from having someone outside of themselves to just yeah, guide them along the way. Be there to support, be there to advise, be there to just to listen, right? People like Bill Gates, Oprah Winfrey, they've all got coaches. So. Absolutely. So it really doesn't matter where you're at. <laughs> you're going to benefit from that. So I suppose it's for, you know, if anybody's listening out there who, you know, knows they are struggling to overcome something that happened whether it was a year ago whether it was 10 years ago whether it was 50 years ago it really doesn't matter right time we say time is a healer but is it really if we haven't actually gone back to deal no the time itself does not heal it's what you do in that time that heals so you can't just say, well, uh, you know, in time, you know, you take you take the loss of a loved one. People say, you know, you'll you'll fall in love with somebody else, and you know, you'll you'll overcome it. But you don't. You know that grief is always there. That that loss is always there. What happens is your heart just grows a little bit bigger that you can allow somebody else in to share it. So not physically, obviously. <laughs> 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 or for so, some uh, their heart can harden you know it can be and then they can actually push people away because I suppose they haven't dealt with yeah I mean I suppose so they so, fear, they've got that fear that they're going to get hurt again and yeah, so sure. I'd rather, I'd, you know with me I put on a, a heck of a lot of weight because it was if I'm fat nobody's going to want to touch me you know, um, so it's those kind of things that we build a barrier rather than deal with and say, you know, I, I can still remember walking down the street and I was wearing shorts and a little top and some man whistled at me. This was shortly after I was raped and my first reaction was, how dare he? <laughs> and then my second reaction was, but I'm a sexy young woman. Why not? <laughs> um, he right. can whistle at you as long as he only whistles and he doesn't do anything else. <laughs> but, but that was that was shortly afterwards. But I hadn't dealt with all the emotions. And, and this is another part. So I hadn't dealt with that emotions. And that's when I started overeating and I started putting on the weight. But also what happened, uh, immediately afterwards, I was so angry that I became an activist and I lobbied and petitioned and led marches and I wanted to make a difference in the world. And I didn't deal with those emotions. I right. didn't so you went through, through the people. anger stage. I went, yeah, but I went straight from victim to survivor without dealing with all those emotions. So I used my anger to become an activist, but I didn't deal with my anger and I didn't deal with the fear and I didn't deal with the guilt and all those other emotions. And so what happened, everybody was saying to me, we're so proud of you, you're so strong, you're so brave, we're so proud of you, you're so strong, you're so brave. Look at me, I'm so strong and brave. Yeah. And uh, two years later, one morning, I couldn't get out of bed. I had this terrible leg and back pain, and I crawled out of bed, went to the doctor, sent for scans and x-rays and what have you, told I have to have a back operation. So I had a back operation. It failed. I had a second back operation. It failed. The doctor sent me home with a home nurse because I was totally dependent. I couldn't even go to the toilet on my own. And um, 
the the doctors, the surgeon said to me that I would never do two things that I loved doing, which was hiking and scuba diving. He said, because I could never carry anything on my back again. And so off I went to home and I lay in bed for six months and everybody fussed and bothered and looked after me. And and then <laughs> two things happened. A doctor friend of mine looked at my x-rays and he said, I wouldn't have operated. I don't see anything wrong. <laughs> and my sister, who was a woo-woo healer, <laughs> unfortunately she's no longer with us, she did very much mind work. And she said that what was happening was I wasn't dealing with my problems. I was putting them behind me and I was putting them behind me and I was putting them behind me until my back couldn't hold it anymore and my back collapsed. And so I hope you're still there. And so I did a bit of mind work. I little, did a little bit of um, uh, mind work, sort of self-healing. And I went for eight chiropractic treatments and I did a five-day hiking trail with a six with a twenty-nine kilogram backpack on my back. Wow! Proved them wrong, huh? So I did, and it was it just showed that it was all psychosomatic. There was nothing wrong with me. I hadn't dealt with those issues. Isn't that and interesting? So because I was so sort of strong and brave, it was wonderful to be so weak and pathetic and let everybody feel sorry for me in that way instead of everybody being so proud of me. And so I needed to be weak. And right. yeah, so that's it's what I It's interesting did. how I suppose it's almost like you're being prompted to, yeah, it's like, hello, knock, knock, knock. You've not dealt with this. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. So it is. Oh. There is still that woo woo in there, isn't there? <laughs> being, yes, it was there. <laughs> definitely, you're being prompted to say, "No, hang on, you haven't, you haven't dealt with this." Uh, very interesting. How the yeah, it's, it just manifests through you, through through your body. Yeah. And so we've been talking about f forgiving people that have done that have wronged you but actually something you mentioned earlier um and that is dealing with grief now that's could be considered something slightly different so could you sort of explain about how the forgiveness side would help with if you were grieving well it, it's, you know each situation will be so different but you might have you might have guilt over things said or things not said that you need to forgive yourself for. Or they might have done something to hurt you and you're still holding a little bit of resentment that they had hurt you even though they're gone now. And so this, the process is still the same. It's about even though they're not no longer there, you can still forgive. You can forgive yourself and you can forgive them for whatever harm that you think they caused you. Um, and you do it ritually. Um, you don't have to face a person to forgive them. You can do it through rituals. I've, I'm a strong believer in rituals. Right. There's that woo-woo again. Steady. I'm going to have to re <laughs> rewrite this. It's not quite just the <laughs> mental perspective. It's definitely the spiritual too. There's definitely Leela. And physical. And it, this, I suppose, this is what this is all about. You know, we... Um, we put so much emphasis, I think, on the physical, everything that's real and, and, and you can touch and, and see. And But I think more and more people are understanding that, you know, with all the sort of, you know, I don't know about you over there, but here in the UK, it's very much the mental health side of things has definitely been picking up over the last few years. So I think a lot of people do have, more of that belief now that there is a link between the mind and the body, but then also there is the spirit, the little bit of woo-woo, um, <laughs> and it's it's incorporating absolutely everything. So, yeah, I would say um, for you, well, there, you've just said it yourself. You had a, a back problem that actually wasn't really a physical thing. It was a, a, a mental manifestation, if you like. Um, so it is all, it's interesting, isn't it, that it is that it is all linked, but we tend to separate it all off 
but actually all parts of it uh, affect our lives in in phenomenal ways i mean you you just said right there that's that was something that was as manifested as something physical you you felt the pain right yeah yeah so it's about it's about treating everything holistically like you say look at the body look at the mind look at the spiritual aspect put it all together you can't you can't isolate them they do work together yeah 100 percent. and and i suppose that's the you know i shouldn't say the problem but the way our health has been thought about up till now is definitely it's just the one the one thing whereas yes we now think so there are so many coaches and and like you say healers out there who who probably have come from a place that they've managed to heal themselves and like you said then they want to give back because they know what they went through they understand what the process was that healed them so now they want to offer it out to others to help others and it's interesting isn't it that it seems to be that anybody that comes from that real life experience tends to look at it as a holistic you know they go into the holistic health and have this understanding that it isn't just the physical symptom it's it's yeah the mental and the spiritual i really wish that our whole medical establishment would would take that on board a little bit more is that the same in south africa yeah you know what i found so interesting is this pandemic the one of the good things that have come out of this pandemic is that people are understanding mental health a lot better um, because so many people have started suffering from various symptoms and problems as a result of the isolation and what have you. And so yeah, we need to we need to address mental health as an issue. It, it's a real issue. Uh, it doesn't have to be an issue. you know we, if we deal with it and treat it properly as as things occur, rather than letting it manifest as in my case, two, it took two years, for it to manifest uh, and if we just know that you don't have to go through that you know so there should be education and and the mental the the uh, the, the general health practitioners should be sharing that information as well yeah do you, do you think that's i mean yeah i would 100 percent agree there is you know people that probably never ever felt they had any kind of mental health issues in the past have definitely you know been feeling it over this last and trust me myself included in that you know um i think everybody has been forced i suppose in a way to actually really have a deep understanding of it whereas maybe they they had taken it all for granted previously and and never given a thought to it so yeah, I agree. I think as a, uh, I think everybody, you know, you've, uh, if anybody hasn't has not suffered in any way from, uh, from it, I'll be very very surprised. Or maybe they're in denial. You know, that, that's that's <laughs> part of that. Um, simple things of just relationships. You know, you suddenly realise the value of relationships when when they're taken away from you. So. You've got to reflect on how that is impacting on your well-being when you don't have that friend to just laugh with and joke with and kiss and cuddle or whatever it is that you want to do. Um, and and we need to be humans. We need touch. We need hugs. You know, hugs are healthy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's how we strengthen our immune system by the transference of different viruses and bacteria and that's how we strengthen we can't stay in this <laughs> cocoon forever right so well we're coming out I'm, I mean I'm in London so you know for us we are just starting to come out we're we're hoping and praying that um next month it will be <sighs> we're finally there how are things over there in South Africa we're going into winter and we've got the third wave has hit us and so it's not good. <laughs> oh, 
goodness, it, it's it's uh, it's oh, it's been just so draining, hasn't it? So there you go. That I mean, there's you know, there's no one. To, there is no. There's no one to blame with this pandemic, is there? There's no attack. You know, the virus is attack. There's no one to actually put all your um, anger out on, is there? With this, this is quite an interesting. You know how how will people get through uh, the whole emotional roller coaster of this pandemic? Who do we forgive? <laughs> <laughs> you forgive yourself for your reaction. You f you can forgive your government for not having the vaccine on time. Really? <laughs> <laughs> that, that might be a step too far, Lois. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. We must forgive even our own government. That, you know, that might seem like a big ask, but we have to do it. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. So um do you have any quick tips that you could if anybody's out there that you know is suffering in yeah. silence do you have any quick tips three three quick tips one is practice that forgiveness every day two is write write your feelings write your emotions write 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 it's so therapeutic to write um also, the benefit of writing is you think you haven't you haven't grown or developed or improved. When you start writing, you can go back and you can look back and say, oh, that's how I felt. I don't feel like that anymore. So you can see your development and, and your healing as it's taking place. But writing is just a very therapeutic thing. Free writing is the best, but if you don't feel you're a good writer, just words and mind maps and just get it out. Get it out. It's also sharing it with the universe. A little bit of woo-woo. The universe takes some of the pain away from you, <laughs> and it lessens the pain. And the, the second, the third one is to talk. Um, you, you talk to a therapist, a healer, a friend. If you've got no one to talk to, talk to your dog or your cat or even your reflection in the mirror. Uh, again, talking helps you express what you're feeling. It helps release pent up emotions and it releases it and shares it with the universe right fantastic and and i suppose not to be yeah not to be afraid of it and uh like you say you know it's it's it is healthy to maybe sit in that emotion but just not stay there too long yeah right yeah so it is i suppose not dwelling on on the thing but you have to face it you have to face it at some time. And, and also say you must divorce the incident from the emotions. The incident happened. You cannot change the incident. Nothing, you know, I think it was Oprah Winfrey said, um, forgiveness is, is hoping, or, or what did she say, something about um, hoping that you'd have a different outcome. You can't change the outcome. That happened. That situation happened. But you can change how you feel about it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, again, if you do that over time, then that I presume that feeling, that negative feeling will just dissipate over time, just get weaker and weaker and weaker. Yeah. yeah, I've got a process where we look for alternative feelings. So instead of hatred, maybe it's dislike. And then instead of dislike, maybe it's acceptance. You know, maybe you'll never love the person, but that's okay. <laughs> but it's finding more positive emotions um, and working with those, how to get those new emotions. There you go. Going back to that emotional scale, if you're right down there in full of hatred and resentment and, and victim, yeah, to jump up to oh, <laughs> ecstatic joy and forgiveness see, would seem impossible jump. But like you say, just moving up the emotion. Or what's the next? What's the, you know? I suppose everybody. We all. One thing that we can say is everybody on the planet, even the ones that have done the attacking. At the end of the day, they could be down there. That's come from they've been down there in victimhood themselves, mm -hmm. which is quite a hard thing to accept. But you know. Research shows that a lot of them were victims themselves. Yeah. So maybe. Hurt people, hurt people. 
there you go. It, it yeah, and it is, and and that is, I think, the hard thing for most people to sort of take on board because we want to punish, and the acceptance that maybe they were went through God knows what as a child, and maybe they just didn't get the support and help they needed back then, and have gone on and stayed down there. So everybody, I suppose, on the planet wants to feel good. That's we we all want the same thing. We all want to feel a little bit better than we did yesterday so having to move up that emotional scale we do, you don't have to jump yeah. we would all like to but i suppose like you say there's a process to everything and also say if you can also just in your heart say that person had they known better at that time they would have done differently had they known better they would have behaved differently there you go. And that's, I suppose, that's all we do. We're all trying to do the best we can with the knowledge that we have at the time. Yeah. But yes, I can, I can, you know, it's, it's a, it is a difficult one. It's a challenging one. And this is why I suppose everybody does need a, just a little bit of help and guidance through this if they're really um, severely struggling. So Lois, if, so if anybody wanted to reach out to you, can you share with the audience, you know, how somebody would get in contact with you? Oh, so read that out. What's that book? <laughs> Walking Without Skin. It's the name of my book. It's the name of my web page and it's the main name of my Facebook page. So Simple. with that, you can't not find me. <laughs> <laughs> walking without skin and and if anybody wanted to purchase that book how would they find it it's on amazon awesome fantastic so how long ago did you write that book uh it started 24 years ago <laughs> I, I started writing at the very night that i was attacked with every intention of publishing it and i only published it last year so i was attacked in 1995 <laughs> <laughs> wow but you did it you got there in the end absolutely yeah. fantastic and how does it feel how does it feel now knowing that you are impacting other people's lives that have maybe gone through something similar to to what you went through well it's just you know, as I said, I started that very night with my activism and then I went back into the corporate world and then I, I went to a conference once in Thailand and somebody on the stage said, who's got a big audacious dream? And I jumped up and said, I do. I want to eradicate sexual violence. I said that. <laughs> and, uh, and I was all motivated again to do it. Then I went back into the corporate world and carried on working uh, so it took me a long time to live that passion that started back in 1995, well, 1996, and it, it, it was my passion. It was what I'm meant to be doing. So I found my passion. It took a long time to find it, but I'm living my passion now. So how does one feel when you're living your passion? Amazing. Amazing. What a story. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lois, for sharing your story with us. And Thank so, you yeah. for allowing me to share it on your platform. Yeah, well, there you go. And, and if anybody is struggling, then I really urge you to reach out to Lois. Um, somebody who's gone through and come out the other side and look where you're at and, right now. And I like to say to everybody, you must fly free. There you go. <laughs> Fantastic. So thank you very much, Lois. And thank you to everybody listening. We will be back next Monday at two o'clock with a coffee with Karen, a cup of positivity with just a sprinkling of woo woo. <laughs> Till then, bye. Welcome to the Coffee with Karen podcast, a weekly chat show discussing everything from holistic health to current affairs from a mental, physical and spiritual perspective. Get your weekly cup of positivity with a sprinkling of woo-woo.